Ephesians chapter 4 and reading from verse 1, where Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says... When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. He gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up to him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. As each part does its work. Amen. Well, when the coalition came to power, one of the things that they wanted to say was, we are all in it together. And many people kind of scratched their heads a bit and said, oh yeah, really? Is that really so? If two people are speaking to you, which person is more listenable? If they are both calling you to adversity, if they're both calling you to hardship, and one, it's quite clear, is living a life of riley, is living a life of great ease, and you've never known him or her to have experienced any kind of hardship. And then on the other hand, there's someone who's calling you to a life of adversity, who themselves is in the midst of that adversity. And they're saying to you, look, it's the only way you can go. But hey, even in the midst of it, I can still stay strong. Which person are you more likely to listen to? Which person are you more likely to take comfort from? And which person are you more likely to heed their advice? The one who has their arms behind their back, as it were, and their feet up, or the person who's got their sleeves rolled up and is there mucking in. Paul has authority. He has authority because he is an apostle. And that gives him authority. And for that reason alone, Paul is to be obeyed. And One of the problems in the early church was that there were those who didn't recognise or were suggesting that Paul wasn't truly an apostle. Therefore, if he wasn't truly an apostle, then he didn't have to obey him. But Paul was an apostle. But his authority as well actually carried additional weight. Because Paul says here, he is a prisoner. As a prisoner of The Lord then, he says. Paul, when he comes to exhort the church, and when he comes to say that, look, you may be heading for a time of adversity, 
He is someone who is speaking from a position of being in adversity, of being and facing trial upon trial. He has already said in chapter 3 that he's a prisoner. He repeats it again in chapter 4 that he is a prisoner. But as a prisoner, has he lost hope? Is he saying, oh, please pray for me, it's really hard here. Pray for my release. There's none of that. He's rejoicing in the Lord, he hasn't lost hope. Is he saying, I've been forsaken? No, he's shouting, as it were, from the prison rooftop, if, if you put it that way, that I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I'm not forsaken. He who had said in another place, my God will supply all your needs, would actually say, if you pressed him, my God has supplied all my needs, especially when I've been in adversity. So Paul doesn't hide or gloss over his triumphs. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he says he was a prisoner of Christ in serving Christ, actually for the Gentiles. But he was Christ's prisoner. Now in chapter 4, verse 1, he says he's a prisoner for the Lord, for the cause of Christ. And so right at the start, we can see and we can say and we're reminded that it doesn't mean becoming a Christian, that you'll have an easy life. Some people teach that. Some people preach that. Become a Christian and everything will be rosy. They're after getting your name on the list of names they can say have been saved by them, by their ministry and so on. You read the Apostles, you read Jesus, you read the whole Bible and you see that it's not an easy life that is promised. But what is promised is that in the midst of adversity, even though you be in prison, God will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. In chapters 1 to chapter 3, Paul has been expounding truth. The truth of Almighty God. He's been unfolding God's eternal purpose in Christ. It has been pure doctrine in a sense. And great and rich and deep teaching. Yes, there have been some exhortation in there. And we've, obviously, I've taken opportunity to exhort in doing it, because in preaching it, because that's the way you do it, as it were. But it's primarily been Paul teaching God's eternal purpose in Christ. How from the ruins of mankind, God is going to and has indeed begun to raise up a new humanity what some might call a third race. There was Jew, there was Gentile, both fallen. There is Christ. And Christ, the last Adam as it were, unfallen by his death on the cross, succeeds in bringing about that plan of God, that promise of God from eternity past. Succeeds in bringing it into fruition. And so a new humanity in Christ is born a third race. And chapters 1 to 3, God, uh, Paul has been expounding these great truths and the various ways in which God has done this and showing it from various sides and angles. But now we come to chapter 4, chapters 4 to 6. And although it doesn't have it in the NIV, in uh, a literal translation, we would start with the word therefore. Therefore. And the therefore is obviously linked with what has been before. And the therefore is this, that having expounded the truth of God, now he comes to exhort the hearer or the reader. He comes to exhort in the light of the teaching. In other words, he's coming to challenge us as to how we must live. And it starts with the word worthy. As a prisoner of the Lord then, for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy. Another translation might use the word fitting. And it would be appropriate then to say fitting, a fitting life in accordance with what God has done for you. But the word worthy in the Greek, the Greek word is axios. From where we get the word axiom. And axiom is often used as a term 
for something that is a given fact, a given truth. It's if your one is making an argument, the starting point of an argument that is something that is acceptable for, by all. In other words, well, we all know that the world is round. Therefore, and so we're using an axiom. We're starting with a premise that something is a given fact. But it's also used in mathematics. And we might link it to equations. Where, I'm thinking of truth, I'm thinking of facts, that if you're making an equation, if you're working out an equation, both sides have to be equal, don't they? For the equation to, to work. And we can think of the word axiom in that context. So think of it then in terms of balance. Because you balance one side with the other. Think of balance. Think of scales. Think of when you were a little child. Perhaps you're not old enough to think of these days, but those days, but uh, in terms of what I'm about to say, but when I was a little child, we had our village sweet shop. And we would go in with our two pence or uh, whatever it might be. Even sixpence was still valid, actually. Two and a half p, because it all changed the currency. But you could use sixpences. And we would buy a quarter of sweets. And the lady would get the jar down that you wanted, and she'd put them in. She'd put a, um, a, a, a four ounce uh, weight on one side, and then pour your sweets in on the other side. Well, it might only be two ounces, but she'd pour it on. And you'd be looking there and longing that it wouldn't even up too quickly, because you wanted more. You might buy something light, some kind of sherbet type thing, and you'd see, whoa, you're getting loads. And then on a pocket money day bat, you'd say, I'll have a half pound. And no matter how many she's putting in, it seems as though the scales are never balancing. More, more, more. Wow, this is wonderful. I'm going to rot all my teeth in no time with this lot. Now think of it in that context, in terms of scales, in terms of balance. Worthy, live a life worthy, live a life balanced, live a life fitting. Fitting with what? Balanced with what? Balanced with what God in Christ has done for you, which Paul has outlined in those first three chapters. Now, is that something that's possible? It's like the scales, isn't it? No matter what we do, no matter the good things that we do, that what God has done for us is never outweighed, it's never balanced, we can never achieve that. Because what he has done for us in Christ is infinite. But that doesn't mean to say we can't try. It doesn't mean to say we mustn't try. It doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean to say that we should just say, well, I can't do it, therefore I won't bother. No. For the love of God, we should want to do it. We should want to live a life worthy. So we try to balance these scales. The scales being the calling you have received. See it there in verse 1? Paul is a prisoner. He urges us to live. Look, he urges. This is not something that's to be taken lightly. It's an exhortation. I urge you. You might even say I command you. But he's pleading to live a life worthy of this great calling that I've already outlined in the previous three chapters. The greatest saints, what would they say? The balancing of the scales? <sighs> I've only just begun. I've only just begun. Indeed, Paul himself says in another place, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect. It's God who makes them perfect, but that will come in glory. He says, but I press on. I keep pouring sweet sin as it were. I keep trying to balance the scales. I can't do it, but I keep doing it. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. His work in us, this great calling that we've received, is God's magnum opus, his greatest work. Ours in response, ours in response, it's like a mere footnote at the end of the page of the great work of God. So in view of what God and Christ has done for us, how ought we to live? How ought we to live? Paul goes from deep theology to daily living. And it won't necessarily be easy. He's a prisoner. And he's reminding us in just saying those words that you come to Christ and that may well be what will happen for you. We live in days where 
Christian living, living a life for Christ is attacked. In our society. It's always been that way in many ways. But perhaps in our society, it wasn't so much so in former times. But now, we live in days where living as a Christian, you'll often find yourself attacked. May you lose your job for it, and so on. Ultimately, it's because how we live as Christians develops from what we believe. We don't live a life in order to please God, in order to get to heaven. From what we believe, we then live out the life that God calls us to. So the Christian has been called into this new society. Therefore, the Christian is called into a life of worthy living. And this is so vital for us that Paul urges us. What is it then? What is it to live a life that is worthy? Or, again, literally, it would be uh, to walk worthy. He urges us to walk worthy of the calling we have received. What is it to walk worthy? Worthy. Well, verse 2 lists such a walk. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So I'm going to verse 3. <laughs> Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's a list of such uh, a walk that is worthy of the calling that we have received. But in a sense, what's condensed there in one verse doesn't really answer it fully because living a life worthy, walking worthy on the calling you've received, well the rest of the epistle, the rest of the letter, kind of deals with that. It's not just taken up in one verse. Paul's habit, oftentimes, is to bring his doctrine, the teaching, and then the exhortation, the call to godly living, as a consequence of what you've heard, therefore live in this way. He does it here, chapters 1 to 3 is doctrine, chapters 4 to 6, generally speaking, is this teaching of, or this exhortation for how to live in the light of. Romans 1 to 11 is the doctrine, in a sense, and chapters 12 to 16 is the exhortation to live that out. Does the same in Colossians, and so on. It's often Paul's way. And so the rest of the epistle is taken up with this living a life that is worthy of the calling that we have received. And what we find is that if we were to split this chapter, we've read most or half of the chapter, if we were to split chapter 4, we would find that Paul is talking first of all about walking worthy in unity. And he deals with that in verses 2 to verse 6. And then from verse 7... To verse 12, walking worthy in diversity. Because some seem to be receive more grace than others. What's all that about? Unity in diversity. Walking worthy in diversity. From 12 to verse 16, it's walking worthy on to maturity. And then from verse 17, it's walking worthy in purity. For, for want of some headings, if you like. Just to show how that chapter, how it breaks up. But today, the great call here for us, verses 2 to 6, although we're not going to get further than verse 2. The great call is to unity. Walking worthy in unity. And when we think of church unity and Christians being united, it's often the cause of much ridicule ridicule isn't it by people in the world because they look and they look into churches as it were they look at the people who call themselves Christian who are part of this church or that church and they see infighting within churches and they see infighting or outfighting as it were uh, across the boundaries as it were between different churches or different denominations why can't you all be as one why, why, why have you got this ch- type of church and you've got that type of church and why have you fallen out with them and they laugh at the lack of church unity. But you know, it's only as we walk worthily of the calling that we've received that we can actually establish Christian unity. We must walk worthy to establish Christian unity. 
Verse 2 brings for us what I would call the virtues of unity. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The virtues of unity. And so taking them up, the first one we come across is humility. Be completely humble. Humility, we might say, is a coat for all weathers. Pride? Well, if you have a proud heart, people who have pride heart, proud hearts, they're not in the habit or not in the frame of mind to want to back down. Keep arguing their corner no matter what. They're right. And even when they're wrong, they won't admit it. Sorry is... As the songwriter said, the hardest word. So very hard, isn't it? To admit our mistakes. People who are proud in their hearts hate all loss of face. What an embarrassment to be in the midst of a company and to be humiliated. Dreadful thing. What actually happens is that your pride is, takes a great, great knock. And that's a terrible thing says the world. The opposite of humility, of course, pride, boasting, haughtiness, seeing yourself as better than others. My sister tells me that when she was a, quite a young girl, she went shopping with my gran, and when they got to the checkout, the early days of supermarkets, when they got to the checkout, there was a lady in front who was paying by check for her goods. Now you've got to think this is many years ago. Paying by cheque for her goods. My grand turned around to my sister and said, just ignore her, she's showing off. <laughs> Perhaps she was, I don't know. But that is how people often like to carry on, isn't it? You know, when you could have a, um, an American Express card, but it was only applicable for those who've got a, a certain you know, amount of cash, as it were. And you could flex, well that's access, isn't it, flexible friend? But you could show the American Express or you could show this particular gold card that you've got. People like to do that sort of thing, don't they? They like to show that they have achieved something, that they've arrived at something. A boastfulness, a better than others. The word humility, of course, is the opposite of that. It's lowliness. But as a word, in the Greek world, it was, it was used in a way, it was a despised word. And a person who was called it, or uh, was like it, was someone who was not to be, was to be pitied, or just treated as something of disgust. Because it was a lowly word. It was despised. Used negatively. One writer says, it was used negatively, in a sense of like someone in a position of crouching submissiveness. As a slave. A bit like Biff on uh, Back to the Future. When he uh, is in the second one, isn't it, where he's suddenly all submissive. He gets hit by the man who one time he was dominating and now he's, you know, he's the one who's all submissive. Okay, okay, I'll do another coat, I'll do another coat. That kind of way was the way in which the, uh, the Greeks would see the word and it was something to be uh, despised. Yet Christ gave new power to that hated term by his own humility. He who had reason, every reason, if anyone ever had reason, it was Christ to be proud. Every reason. You're the author of creation. He's the giver of life to every man, isn't he? He holds all the planets in his hands. Well, do you want me to go on? <laughs> he had reason to be proud, but he laid aside. He laid aside his majesty. And what he did was he clothed himself. He put on humility for us. And so when we consider that, we think of someone who's boasting. Well, where does our boasting come from? What, what reason, what right have we got? 
What truth is there behind my boastful, my boastful statement that I can do this or I can do that, I'm triumphant at this or I'm better than you at that or whatever it might be. As though something within me has created this power that I may have. I am better than you at whatever it is because I've developed that. Yet, we looked at this recently. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, Who makes, this is in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, we looked at this recently, I think it was in an evening message, Who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why, did you, why do you boast? And so you did not. So here I am, I'm, I'm faster than you at running, for argument's sake. What makes me, who makes me different from anyone else? Who makes me faster? It's God. God is the one who gives the gift to men. Okay, well there's two men and they're equally fast. But one's faster than the other because he's trained a bit more than the other one. Ah, so I've made myself faster. No, you haven't. We've just listened to our brother praying about the good health that we have. is given by God. I'm going to run ten miles tomorrow. Are you? God can lay me low at any moment. God is in control of our health. God is in control of the training. God is the one who actually is in control of the desire, as it were, for that training. Who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? It wasn't something that I inherently... Let's deal with speed again. You know, there I am, I'm faster than anyone. It wasn't something that I inherently created myself. I got up one morning and I thought, well, I'm not very fast, but I want to win the Olympic gold at the 100 metres and the 200 metres and the 400 metres and the 800 metres and the 1600 metres, 1500 metres, and the 3000 metres. I want to win them all. So I sit down and I concoct some kind of technique or whatever that's purely of my own making. I make myself able to win gold in all of those. Doesn't happen like that, does it? What do you have that you did not receive? We receive all our gifts from God. If you did receive it, why do you boast? So you did not. To consider ourselves as though we are nothing. To consider ourselves as though we have nothing. Is actually, I know it sounds quite negative and it sounds like I put you down, but that's the correct way to look at it. Because all the talents and all the abilities we have, they're given by God. And particularly when we think of our salvation, we can contribute nothing to that. Absolutely nothing. It is all of him. The way to serve is the way that Paul did. Acts 20 verse 19 he said, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. With great humility. That's how he served. He didn't say, now listen here, I am an apostle. Listen here, I have seen the risen Lord Jesus of you. Bah, therefore I'm better than you, so you better listen to me. Now he used that testimony in the right way. And there were times when he had to exert and to show his authority, as it were, right enough. But he was a humble man. Just like Moses, who was the humblest man on the earth. Because humility is a characteristic that is God-given. The person who is marked by humility is a person who is showing that they are walking worthy, or walking in a worthy way of the calling they have received. You see, if God brings the truth of his word to your heart and brings that new life, then it follows that there must be an ongoing improvement in the way you live your life. And the quality or the virtues within you will flourish. And the first of these here listed by Paul is humility. The way to serve is in humility, as Paul did. Humility should be our clothing. All of you, says Peter, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore. 
under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. Humility should be our clothing, not just in the winter. It should be a coat for all seasons, a coat for all weathers. And by that we can think of our uh, spring times in terms of our life where things are picking up, things are looking good and I'm feeling good about myself today. How are summer times? Where are things just going hunky-dory wonderfully well? Where you're like that friend of mine I once mentioned who could play pool and sometimes he was so good, everything seemed to go so well that he could do a trick where he could throw the ball behind his head, the, the cue ball behind his head, hit it with the back of his heel and catch it as it came back over his head with the other hand and say, who's next? One of those days. Even in those days, where everything's going well for you, clothe yourself with humility. And in the autumn, maybe it's the autumn of life. Maybe you're getting older. You still stay clothed with humility. And the winter time, when there's adversity, real trial upon you. Doesn't seem to be a way out. Everything seems frozen. Even your praise is frozen. Clothe yourself with humility. But then secondly, he speaks of gentleness. Be completely humble and gentle. Gentleness, of course, is a fruit of the Spirit. Indeed, much of what Paul is saying here in this verse is really talking about the fruit of the Spirit. But gentleness, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, in this verse, is it 21 to 23, somewhere around then, you've got the fruit of the Spirit. It's the nine fruits. It doesn't mean to say that, well, I've got kindness, you've got gentleness, I'll have love, and you can have faith. All of these go together. And the person who's through the teaching of God's word, their heart has grown to love him, or is growing to love him more and more through their understanding of the word of God applied to their heart, now wants to live out the life that is worthy of that, calling that they've received, and the way of living it out is that they start to grow and to manifest these fruit of the Spirit. God-like characteristics or Christ-like characteristics. Christ-likeness is again a brother prayed. Gentleness, fruit of the Spirit. Jesus, gentle, saviour, meek and mild. But just look at the Jews. They were expecting their Messiah, you all know this. The kind of Messiah they were expecting, they thought would be a king who would get rid of the Romans. They were looking for someone who could vanquish some of their enemies. Someone who would be able to wield a sword like, well Rambo didn't wield a sword, did he? But like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Conan the Destroyer, that kind of thing. That's what they were waiting for. That's what they were looking for. A Messiah who was very violent. But when Jesus came... He practiced and he preached, turning the other cheek. He used no force. Yet it wasn't a gentleness that is often associated with weakness. Some people speak of the word gentleness and meekness could be another way of looking at the word as being a weakness. It was not weakness. Though Jesus used no physical force, though he did no one physical harm, it was not weakness. Actually, in his gentleness, the greatest strength of all was required, was needed. Because gentle Jesus, meek and mild, conquered sin, conquered death, and conquered the stranglehold that the devil had upon us because of sin. He destroyed all that by his great work on that cross which was a warfare second to none Jesus was not weak and when we are called to gentleness we are not called to weakness to be timid and to be what does the Bible say to Paul to Timothy God has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear the power and of love and of a sound mind exercise it exercise it as I say the word can sometimes be translated Meek, meekness. Meekness. Look at this. Why force your way now? Why force through something now to get something small now? Oh, I'm going to have my say about this. I'm going to take my, I'll sort this person out. I want my rights. 
forcing your way. The violent way, the way of force. Why force your way now? For a small gain. Because Christ has earned the kingdom through his gentleness. The meek shall inherit the earth. So let it go. It doesn't matter. Let God be the one who brings about vengeance. Nothing will escape his sight. It is his to avenge, not for us. So there's time to just let it go. And to focus and to look on the fact that Jesus himself said, the meek will inherit the earth. That's the future. Why am I bothering with such a trivial thing? When laying that aside, I can focus on that which is far, far, far greater. I'm going to inherit the earth because of what Christ in his gentleness has done. The mild response to others is a form of gentleness. Maybe you've been wronged. Maybe I've been wronged. But look at Jesus. When he was there before the high priest and all the wretched authorities. And he started to speak and someone slapped him in the face. When that happened to Paul, what did Paul say? God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. That's what Paul said. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Why did you strike me? Even Paul resorted to violence when he was struck there. But not Jesus. Gentle Jesus. Meek and mild. But even at that time, he was in the midst of a warfare. Because upon his back, as it were, upon him, as it were, was every kind of temptation of hell to give in to the task that was confronting him. That of going through all this sham of a trial. That of going before Pilate and all his pathetic ways. That of being treated with utter contempt and despised by man. And being nailed upon a cross. But he did it all in the spirit of gentleness. Nor is gentleness a way of, well, let me rephrase that. Gentleness is where we're not forceful, forceful to the Lord. In other words, why have you done this? Why has this happened to me now? That's not the spirit of gentleness, is it? That's not meekness before God. Gentleness before God is accepting. Accepting of the trial that God has placed upon you. Paul, a prisoner. <laughs> There's no tears there. There's no, before I go on, please pray for me. There's no, oh, why, why, why? He's accepting of it. There's no wagging his fist at Almighty God. How dare anyone do that? And yet people do. There's none of that. That's not going to encourage unity. And ultimately, this is what we're talking about here. That these are the virtues that will lead to unity. The virtues that bring unity. And if I'm moaning and grumbling about my lot and complaining about why God has allowed this or that to happen, how's that going to foster unity within the fellowship? Because from my lips, all people are hearing is negative. Grumbling about God. It's not going to encourage you to uh, worship the Lord. It's not going to encourage the unity in the fellowship. Humility, gentleness. Thirdly, we read, be patient. Be patient. Patience, the master of one's self. Being the master of yourself, but the servant of others. Patience. Self restraint. Occasionally on the television you can catch. Some of us do have them. Most of you know that series from the 70s. Michael Crawford as Frank Spencer. And there was Frank and just 
you know, comes to mind the many situations where he would be before someone, usually a man, who would say, well, what's your problem then? One time he was with a psychiatrist. Another time it might be a doctor. Someone else, another time it might be someone else. And they're showing how, how patient they are. No, 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 you've, you've got your problems. That's fine. I'm the most patient of men. By the end, as you know, the way the story unfolds is by the end they're pulling their hair out. They're throwing him out of the room. They're, Get away from me. They're, they're having a nervous breakdown and that kind of thing. It's not patience, is it? Well, that's patience that's failed. And that's patience as the world brings, as it were. That's the patience that we have naturally, that has a limit to it. But patience we're talking about here, this God-given fruit, as it were, self-restraint. It's an inward calm. An inward calm. Being the master of oneself, yet the servant of others. An inward calm. Strength under control. It's the quality, in a sense, of a person who is able to avenge, yet refrains from doing so. Now, that might not mean necessarily they're able to avenge because I can beat you in an arm wrestle, but able to avenge, as in able to attack. Able to go on the warpath, able to lose my rag, able to do all this. And yeah, it may be justifiable. Maybe I might even feel I've got justifiable reasons for raging, as it were. Yet, it is the quality who is what of one who is, yes, able to do all of that, yet refrains from doing so. We think of it in another word, and we think of it in the Lord, in terms of long suffering. Long suffering. Look at the Lord and how long suffering he is with his people, with the world. You read, don't you, and uh, Paul it is who, uh, sorry, Peter it is who speaks in this way, who says how the Lord waited patiently in the days of Noah. The whole world was just in wickedness, and yet God waited. Maybe even up to a hundred years before bringing that judgment on the world. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. As well as building that ark, he was proclaiming the word of God to the nation, to the people. And telling them to repent, telling them the the judgment that was going to come. God was patient. Long-suffering. In the book of Numbers we read, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love. And forgiving sin and rebellion. Peter again in 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, just like he was in the days of the ark, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why does the world carry on as it does? Why is it that Christ has not returned? Why is it that we haven't now, we aren't now able to be living on that new earth that if we're in Christ we're going to inherit? Why isn't that so? Why isn't it that we're actually in the presence of Christ in reality? Why is it that we're still living by faith and not by sight? Because of the long suffering of God. Not wanting anyone to perish. That each generation should have the opportunity to come to Him in repentance. And faith. And this goes with bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. To hold back, to restrain, even though you've been wronged. And you can see, really, as, as you look at these, all, all three of these terms humility, gentleness, patience, all three are very closely linked. In some ways it's hard to, in a sense, distinguish between them. Much of what is said on one could quite easily and validly be said on another. The person who does do good, does do something that is good, or is good at a certain thing, as they do so, they don't boast about it. Because they recognise that they've received this particular gift from the Lord. And they're content in themselves. Even though others have wronged them, they have an inner calm. 
rather than promote themselves, they would encourage others. Now when it comes to what we would call the fundamentals of the faith, the very basic truths of the gospel, without which there can be no gospel, the essentials, for an example, there is no cross. There is no cross. There's no Christianity in this. That's a fundamental. There is a cross. Jesus died on it. But there is no resurrection. There is no resurrection. Without no resurrection, we're still in our trespasses and sins. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is a fundamental. Those kind of fundamentals. We don't let go of them. We don't remain silent when those are contested. In the world, we take every opportunity with gentleness to present present those great truths, those fundamental truths. And we present them with prayer, hoping and praying that the Lord would take the scales away from their eyes that they would see them. But in the church, if there be any in the church that would deny fundamentals of the faith, we don't leave it. We don't say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to bother about that. I'll leave that to the Lord. We take it up. It's a fundamental. We have to. But we take it up in a way of humility, in a way of meekness, gentleness, and with much, much patience. We try as much as we can to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And think, would I listen to what is being said if someone was grabbing me around the neck and shouting at me, you must have been in it, I wouldn't listen to a word of it. So we do it in such a way as to try to win them back over. But we must do it. Because to not do it is weakness, isn't it? And to not do it is to deny the very fundamentals of the faith that God has given us. It's to be ashamed of it in a sense. But when it comes to secondary issues, secondary issues, such as when will the Lord return? What will things be like when the Lord returns? Will all the world be saved before the Lord returns? Or will the world all be in darkness? Will there be a great falling away? Those kind of secondary issues. I believe that the Lord is going to return. And then there's going to be, not a judgment, but there's going to be a continuing and a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. So, that's one way of looking at the end. Another person says, I don't believe a word of that. I believe that when the Lord returns, that's the end. Which is what I believe, actually. But I'm not going to fight over what is a secondary issue. That brings disunity, doesn't it? Disharmony to do such a thing. But then there are what we might call tertiary issues. Do you know there was, some years ago now, a ch- and churches fall out and divide over all sorts of things, don't they? Should we have, you know, a church building that dates back to, I don't know, um, pre-Victorian times and beyond, Middle Ages? Should we keep the pews or not? People get into a rage about such a thing. They were good enough for my father. They were good enough for my grandfather. Uncle Bert was converted in that pew. Look, you can still see the stain of the way cut himself as he fell over to cry out to the Lord and he hit his head and the blood stood there. You dare get rid of that pew. You get things like that, don't you? There was a church in America some years ago that divided. And it was so serious that the division, two sides said, we want the building. No, we want it. That they did that which is unscriptural. And they went to the secular courts to get them to decide. The secular courts rightly threw it out. It came before an ecclesiastical court, probably connected with the denomination. And they looked into all the evidence. And they looked into the reasons why there was this disunity in the first place. And they discovered 
that it had begun at a fellowship meal over a piece of ham. That there was one man in the church who looked at the amount of ham, I've done this, haven't I? <laughs> but he looked at the amount of ham on his plate and he saw that there was a child nearby who had more ham than him. And that led to the dis- division and the splitting of the church. You see, the teaching, the teaching of Christ, in and of itself, should so humble us. Paul shouldn't need to say, be humble. He shouldn't need to say any of those things. There's a part of me that that thinks, in a way, the word should never be applied, because, in terms of your preaching, because surely the Holy Spirit applies it to our hearts. As we see these things, we think, phew, in the light of that, Lord, what can I do for you? But it's right to apply it. We must apply it. It's right to, and so on. But... There's a sense in which in seeing these things, chapters 1 to 3, that we're so humbled by it. And humility is one of the virtues, one of the virtues of unity. Was there humility in that church that fought over a piece of ham? What does it say about the teaching in the church? What does it say about that? They could lose sight of godliness so much but then fourthly love or love is the supreme virtue bearing with one another in love this one in a sense uh, envelops them all doesn't it we turn to Colossians chapter 3 we read Therefore, as uh, verse 12, as God's chosen people, this uh, verse, this uh, passage in Colossians, is so similar. Many people argue that Ephesians and Colossians were written at a similar time, and that both epistles were taken out by uh, a messenger from Paul to the various churches. Very similar. Therefore, as God's, verse 12 of chapter 3, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, or bearing with each other, and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love embraces all. In 1 Corinthians, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Paul goes on to say these three remain. Faith, hope and love. Greatest of these is love. In glory, there's no need for faith. In glory, hope is gone. No need for faith. No need to hope because it's reality. And all that remains is love. It is the crowning, oh, it is a crown upon the head of all these virtues, all these qualities. The virtues of unity, of course, are all perfectly balanced in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he, the Lord Jesus Christ, did not open his mouth. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. And humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Paul speaks. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I appeal to you. That's what he says to the church at Corinth. But the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. All these virtues are perfectly balanced in him. Humility, gentleness, patience and love. Now, unity's foundation, which we're going to go on to, God willing, in the next verses, unity's foundation has doctrine as its base. It's not wishy-washy. It's not just all love. 
All we need is love. Think of the Beatles song. All we need is love. It has doctrine as its foundation, as its base. But there are many churches that are right in terms of the base. Many churches that are right in terms of the doctrine. Many churches who understand chapters 1 to 3 would seem right, yet it's not lived out. Not lived out. You see, the virtues of unity are must-haves. It's not just about doctrine. Doctrine entering the heart. The Holy Spirit dwelling within the heart. Welling up within the heart. Bringing out these virtues of unity so that one walks worthily. And we don't sit back and wait for the Holy Spirit to enable me to do this. It's something we must practice. It's something we must pray about. It's something we must strive to keep. But as we do so, He enables us. He comes to us. And He strengthens us. And in every temptation, there's always a way out. You see it afterwards, oftentimes after you've fallen. But it's always there. Where these virtues of unity are absent, there can be no true unity. Without them, any perceived unity will be a mere facade, a painted facade. For it is God's given way to walk the virtuous path. And it's surely pleasing in his sight when he sees his saints doing so. James says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, raise a harvest of righteousness. Those are the ones who promote unity. So here we have in verse 2 a character reference. Character reference of you and I. Are we those who are walking worthily in the light of the richness of God's doctrine? In the light of the calling that we have received? Character reference. Does it say of you in paragraph one, he or she is noted for her humility, his humility? In terms of gentleness, second to none. Patience, oh yes. Patience abounds within that brother, within that sister. Noted, above all, for bearing with one another in love. So we must learn our doctrine, that is vital. But we learn our doctrine and then... As a consequence of that. And that's indeed on our notice sheet here. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect, and the knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. You see, the knowledge of the truth, it leads to godliness. It must do. If it's hard knowledge, if it's changed your life, it has to. We learn the doctrine. But it's vital that we walk worthily. The doctrine should so fill us with love for God as to want to live worthily. And that, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that is what brings unity.